also had noticed that the Washington Women's Art Center had uh, gotten little, if any, attention in recent um, historical documentation of the Washington uh, DC art scene in the 70s and 80s. And I, in particular, was concerned that somehow all the work we did and the um, energy that we had uh, would really be lost to history. So this really seemed like the right time to be doing this. Um, the project for me has really been a journey both backwards and forwards. Backwards meaning I had to go back into archives at the Martin Luther King Library, Washingtoniana Room, uh, and looked at, well, I don't want to say looked at all of them, but there were 125 boxes of archives in the Martin Luther King Library and also in the National Museum of Women in the Arts Library. Um, my historical search at the time, I was focused on identifying former members, jurors, anybody who, or ex exhibitors, anybody who had participated, so that that would be the foundation of how we would contact people. Um, that turned out to be a little bit challenging because um, we didn't have updated addresses for anybody, certainly no email addresses. I was reminded that actually in the 1970s, Washington was relatively small and we didn't actually have to bother with area codes. I don't know if any of you remember that. But yeah, so you, you could call from Maryland to Virginia just, you know, with uh, whatever seven digits. Um, but, you know, ultimately it became obvious that even if we had all that information that out of the 800 members, it was eventually 800 members, uh, a lot of them, their contact information would not be the same. So ultimately, um, we decided to, uh, what we ended up doing was mainly by word of mouth. And so um, I, uh, we had a, a Facebook page, which certainly was, uh, you know, for people who did Facebook, and I was told a lot of people don't do Facebook, and I don't, but we did have that Facebook page, and it helped. Um, I went over to uh, the Mount Rainier Open Studio one day, and I ran into a lot of women who had been artists at the Washington Women's Art Center, and I gave them cards, told them about the show, and then as we approached the deadline, um, and I was <clears throat> getting a little bit nervous about the number of submissions. Uh, it was kind of a good opportunity that the Washington, I'm sorry, the uh, National Museum of Women in the Arts had a, uh, an event. It was a photo project called Now Be Here. And it was, they were trying to photograph all the local Washington women artists. And so I said, aha. And I took a pile of business cards and went down there and I approached pretty much every woman, say of a certain age, and, <laughs> and I said, were you a member of the Washington Women's Art Center? And it turns out a lot of them were. And I told them about the exhibit and I gave them my business card and as I did at Mount Rainier, I said, please tell everybody else you know who, who might have been a member. And I think that ended up being the most effective way to get the, you know, the, the word out, you know, I said that we have a Facebook page and we have this November deadline, but please, you know, uh, take a look at it, call me if you have any questions. And in the end, we had, if you've been into the museum, you've seen that we had a actually very nice response. Um, I do want to, uh, w one of the things when I was doing the research, we did not have a, um, comprehensive ongoing history of the center. Um, we certainly had uh, catalogs, we had invitations, we had a lot of documentation, but we didn't have anything like a narrative. We didn't have things like who was the executive director, the gallery coordinator, and when. We, we, were, we missed all that. And it was kind of a struggle to pull all that together. And so I really want to thank the people who did that, Barbara Willanen and Claudia Vess, um, actually pulled together a wonderful narrative that was in the catalog. Um, Lucy Blankstein and Eloise Schottler did the, if you've seen it, the, the Voices of the Washington Women's Art Center, which memorializes a lot of the people who participated early on. I want to thank Fran Francie Hester, who was our last executive director before we closed. She um, 
was she made sure that all of those 120 boxes of archives were sent to the Martin Luther King Library because otherwise we really would have had a problem reconstructing anything. And Sandra Reichel, Lindsay Makepeace, and Sarah Hyde Klein also added additional boxes of records to the National Museum of Women in the Arts, their library. And finally, there were some angels somewhere who went through all those 125 boxes and indexed them. So that made it a little bit easier for me when I was looking through them to say, well, I don't have to look at all 120. I can look at a few. But I, I have to say the most interesting part of this for me has been that it's been a collaboration, that so many people have worked hard on this, and it actually reminded me, and this sort of the looking backwards and looking forwards, uh, it reminded me of the early days of the Washington Women's Art Center when everybody pitched in. And it's just, we're, we're still doing the same thing, and I think we really have a wonderful result from that. Thank you. Yeah, that's enough. <laughs> I, I think I went over my five minutes. I think I went past my five minutes. No. Five minutes One minute five over, minutes. but who's counting? <laughs> so I'm Barbara Frank. And, um, Get closer. Get closer. Close. Right there. Closer. Is this close enough? So I'm Barbara Frank, and I wanted to talk about two things, or kind of the two kind of what my involvement was, um, and how I, from a personal point of view, became involved in working on women's activities and kind of setting the scene for what it was like in the, remi reminding us all of what it was like in the 60s and the 70s. And so I can only talk from my personal experience, and that focuses on what the, the environment was like in the 60s, the late 60s and the 70s. I was very naive about politics and kind of the world, and Rosemary Wright said we all were naive. Um, then it was the middle of the civil rights period, which was actually 100 years after the Civil War. We were dealing with voting rights, the Vietnam War, the draft, and I only recently realized that the feminist art movement was actually part of the civil rights movement. We thought of it as like an art activity, but it was really part of the fabric of civil rights. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you what I wrote. I hope it's not boring. Um, until I was searching for Katie Kolwitz in the, in the only survey of art history book used nationally at the time, I didn't notice that it included no women artists at all. Here's a Wikipedia quote from Norma Browdy and Mary Garrard's book. Women artists in the 1950s and 1960s suffered professional isolation, not only from one another, but also from their own history in an era when women artists of the past had been virtually written out of history of art, H.W. Janssen's influential textbook, The History of Art, which was first published in 1962, contained neither the name nor the work of a single woman artist. And it was the book that was used to, for learning about art history all over the country, big fat books. Um, so then it, and Jansen even at one time was introduced to a woman artist by a curator at MoMA who, um, and Jansen liked, the author liked this woman's work, but he told her directly that he didn't put women painters in his books. <laughs> so um, that was the atmosphere in the 60s. And in 1971, um, there was an, an essay by Linda Nochlin in Art News about titled Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? She's a feminist historian. Can, are you having trouble hearing? Okay. So this period was set, <laughs> Betty Friedan's book, Feminist Mystique, was, um, was published in the 1960s. In the, late, in the late 60s, early 70s, Ms. Magazine was founded. There had been no women's magazines, professional women's magazines before then. The National Organization of Women was founded. Um, birth control pills were, were developed, which had a big influence. There were all kinds of protests going on, especially in Washington. It was this time of steep learning curves. One of the things that influenced the women's art activities in Washington was the fact that the Corcoran had a biennial that included no women. Do you, Rosemary, do you know the year? That was in 1970, I think. And um, Mary Beth Edelson 
took leadership and picketed the Corcoran. Um, <laughs> at that same time, um, we had Judy Chicago showing up with her boxing ring photographs in national magazines, and Judy and Miriam Shapiro created the Cal Arts Feminist Art Program in 1970. And out of these things, the women's, we, here in Washington, I was part of a group that developed the women's conference, the National Conference from Women in the Visual Arts. And it developed na very naturally and organically out of Mary Beth's um, picketing and all of the news about women and these publications that were coming out that had been boiling up for a long time. Um, the, so six of us got together and formed a committee that, that developed this national conference. And that, Mary Beth really was responsible for the most of the work and that she was really um, dynamic. And we created a conference in 1972 that brought 300 women to the Washington area, to the Corcoran and the University of Maryland. Um, one of the reasons that we got, um, it was a good time for funding for women and the, the Corcoran had their guilt about not having no women in the, in the biennial. And so they provided money and space, and they really sponsored the conference. And the University of Maryland did the same thing. They were in a position where they, they didn't give women tenure. They didn't give professors tenure. And at that time, they lost one of the world-famous Rodin scholars because they wouldn't give her tenure. So Maryland also provided money for these things. And so we, the, the reason we wanted to have a conference is because we wanted to meet the people that, we, we wanted to meet um, a lot of these artists and we invited people we wanted to meet. People asked us how we chose. So we chose people that we wanted to have come here and meet and we were all surprised when everyone accepted. And that, um, that became a foundation for national activities. We didn't think of ourselves as feminists. Um, part of the evidence for that is the name of the conference was the Women in the Visual Arts Conference. And one of our workshops, there were 20 workshops and lectures and slide presentations, and one of the workshops was called The Feminists. And they, we, you know, somehow, I don't know why we did that, but somehow we thought they were separate from the rest of us. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and um, it was, we, um, it was pretty much a, a white, white women's event, but we did reach out to people of color and Hispanic people, and, um, and with some success. Um, do many of you know who Lois Maylou Jones is? She was a professor at Howard. She led one workshop on people of color. Um, the, um, and it's hard to describe the um, fervor of this group and the excitement of this group. There are a couple of people in the audience who were there, and it was, uh, you were there. And it, um, it had a spiraling effect nationally. There were more than 300 people. They spilled, the last event was in the, um, in the auditorium at the Corcoran. We went over their occupancy limit. So all the aisles were filled with people and all the spaces, there was standing room only. And the final event, and it became, um, it was not quiet. It was <laughs> um, a couple of anecdotes about it. Alice Neal came. She was, she was not one of the panelists in, or presenters, but she came with a the whole slide carriage of her work. And she um, hijacked this large meeting to, and, <laughs> and, ins and insisted that um, we watch her slides. And then Lois Maylou Jones's workshop was not well attended. And so she figured after Alice showed all of her, her slides that she was going to show her workshop slides. So she insisted. And in the middle of it, Alice Neal walked out of the auditorium. <laughs> and <laughs> she just stood up and walked out. Should I tell the rest of this story? <laughs> so by that time, we were all completely exhausted and um, you know, not functioning very well. And I was out in the hallway in the Corcoran, kind of hiding under a table. And, <laughs> and Alice Neal walked out of the auditorium and she asked me where the bathroom was. Have any of you heard this story? <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a legend uh, that has all, you know, that. Uh, so she walked out and asked me where the bathroom was, and you know, it's really far away from the entrance to the, where the school was. So she said it's too far, and she 
walked out of the building to the steps to New York Avenue and she squatted and peed. <laughs> so, and walked away. And so that story became legendary. Like someone else, Cynthia Bickley Green said, well, I saw her, I was outside, I, that was my story. And then somebody else said, I saw her, she was, it was on the front steps of the Corcoran, that wasn't on the back steps. And then there's a legend in the school that there's a stain on the marble floor and it was where she peed. So, um, and it's in some books and uh, Mary and Norma feel that it wasn't just accidental kind of old age problems, but that um, she was really demonstrating her, um, her lack of respect for authority. <laughs> that it was truly feminist act, that she wasn't going to obey any rules. So, um, so, and we had another incident with Helen Frankenthaler. We tried to get the most famous women artists we could. So we asked her to be um, the, a keynote speaker and she refused, but somehow in the meantime, um, an, an early press release went out with her name. And the next thing we knew, um, we were getting uh, notarized letters from her attorneys saying that if we didn't rescind it, that <laughs> that we would be sued. And um, so she had no interest in associating with women at all, with other women. It was um, not what she wanted to do. So there were good and bad stories, but we had w wonderful people there. And so out of that, there was kind of a foundation laid all over the country for starting to do feminist art activities. And the, um, and not just that, but the politics of the time. It was, you know, it was a, a good time to organize things and people were energetic and, um, you know, really just, you could, you could act more freely then and create things like the center. So my, personally, I went to California and saw what was going on in Los Angeles. I came back here and when watched what they were doing, they had a women's building in Fresno, I think, and and um, and I felt like we could have something like that here. And we started working on the art center. I call, I have finally figured out a title for myself. I was the founder of the founders committee. So, <laughs> and um, so I I have questions that about. Um, did I skip a page of things I want to say? Let me see. So, so th right now I have these questions about what we're, what's going on. Is this parallel to the political climate of those days? And I don't think it is. It's quite different now. But we still have many of the same problems and our civil rights are being uh, accosted and all, all the time now. And when you, um, I have an article here by a woman named Mara Riley, who's the executive director of the National Academy of Design in New York. And it's about crunching the numbers and what progress women's, women in the arts have made or not made in all these years. It's more than 40 years. Um, and um, and it's, she, set, she has an illustration in it that says that it's not that the glass is half full, it's now about 33.3% full. And so our representation in museums and galleries and art criticism and auctions is, is very low. Um, compared to male participation. And we think of it as, as um, because the power structures are the same. We're, even not, we're not represented well in Wikipedia because it's based on the old kind of uh, hierarchy of knowledge that's a male-based hierarchy. It's just an online encyclopedia. And most of the editors are men. So there's work to be done, but it seems like it's a different context now. So, thank you. You're welcome. That's great. <laughs> and I have co a few copies of that article that um, you can take or look at. There are 15 copies if you want to look at it afterwards. Right. Tyna. Oh. Hi, I'm Tyna Litwack, and um, I was executive director of the Washington Women's Art Center the first year it was at Landsberg's. Yep. Okay, the first year that it was at Landsberg's. Um, uh, my name is Tyna Litwack, and I'm... Yeah, Tilt it up to your mouth there. All right, it's kind of tall. I think that's the problem. All right, let's try that. It won't stay up. Okay, here. Um, okay, 
and I was the executive director of the Washington Women's Arts Center the first year that it was at uh, Landsbergs. So uh, that was 1984. So I became executive director in January of 1984. Um, Helen Levine was executive director before me, and but the but the planning of the move to Landsbergs had taken started many years before that. I'm not exactly sure when this dates from because the Xerox I got, the scan that Judith did out of the archive says 1980 question mark. So I don't know <laughs> what year this really was, but um, it lists the programs, committees, and groups. Nothing is dated, it's phenomenal. All this stuff in the archives, we didn't put dates on anything. It's shocking. <laughs> But one of the things that we had then, besides the Alternative Spaces Committee, we had a building committee. And it says, because WWAC is one of the 27 arts groups moving into the Landsberg building to become part of the Washington Humanities and Arts Center, there is a need for members to help with painting the walls, building partitions and pedestals, installing light fixtures and other tasks. Also, as the center's library is developed, shelves need to be built. If you can help, contact the committee. But I think that the first thing that went in there from the down on P Street was a um, was a workshop space. I think that became active before the gallery did. Um, so I'm sort of the second generation of uh, the Washington Women's Art Center members. Uh, I moved to Washington in 1980, and found out that the center existed immediately and was so excited because I considered, I've always, I sort of grew up with the feminist movement in the, in the mid, in the 70s and considered myself a feminist. So that was sort of a given. And the fact that the Washington Women's Art Center existed was the ultimate thing I had moved to DC for. Um, but I didn't know it was here, but once I got here, that was, that was a phenomenon. So uh, I joined immediately and entered a lot of shows and then eventually became executive director. And the, the, the cool thing about it was that there were women involved in all phases of the arts. There were not just visual artists. Um, you know, I got involved with doing, producing the Edith C. Blum series. One of the women who was spearheading that at the time, after you, Claudia, I think, was Geraldine Gilstrap, and she was a playwright. And so I got to work with all these people who did other things, Michelle Parkerson, the poet, and um, I got to meet Sharon Farmer and work with her. Uh, people in the feminist movement in, in Washington, there was a group called Roadwork that produced Sweet Honey in the Rock. So I got connected with them and Sister Fire, and, and it was all through this feminist network that I think the Washington Women's Arts Center was really a part of and I really appreciated it for that. Um, so then I became, becoming, getting on the board, nominated to the board and becoming executive director was a, really a buzz for me. I was only 27 and I was director of this 800 person collective gallery with 15, you know, 25 committees and a lot of people doing a lot of work. And it was a big responsibility and it was, it was great. It was great training for life. Um, and I think a lot of people got that out of it. Um, and you know, like I say, I'm in the second wave. And I know there was some, there was some controversy about moving completely out of the Q, original Q Street space, but um, I found that moving to the Seventh Street space was really exciting because the Q, for me as a second wave, the Q Street space was small and very well established. It was in a I'm not gonna say it was st a stodgy neighborhood, but by comparison to the Landsberg building and the downtown area, it was. It was, it was the establishment. You know, it was where the uptown galleries were in, in DC at the time. And moving downtown was, uh, it was a very different vibe. It was more like Soho-ish. I mean, it was grungy. It was um, the Washington, uh, the WPA was down there and they had just had a show called The Ritz I don't know if anybody remembers the Ritz. And um, you know, I, was, I had a piece in the Ritz and I lived down there and a lot of artists were like camping out and living in their studios in the Atlantic building and the Atlas building. And um, the DC punk scene was kind of blooming down there. And, and I just, I found it very exciting. And you know, we would go and I would, we would have board meetings in these, because the ceilings were so high in Landsbergs, we only had partial walls around in the gallery. So we'd have these board meetings in, 
in this in our space in our office space in the, off the gallery and there were the Af the dancers in drumming groups were drumming and the you know there was there was oh there were so many people running around and it was there was so much going on it was really it was really interesting um, I actually was I I was lucky enough and I think a lot of this happened to a lot of women with the Washington Women's Art Center. We moved on after a point because we were able to get representation in, in non-co-op galleries. We got representation in commercial spaces. Or some of you got, went to New York, I think. Um, and, you know, other art centers. But, you know, I was able to get representation because one of the women that I worked with on the board of the Washington Women's Art Center became a dealer and she opened a gallery she called the Wallace Wentworth Gallery and she took me into her stable um, and that was a, that was an amazing connection and I got connected with some art historians who I, I'm still friends with Mary Jo Agerston and is one and it was just a, it was just a great thing so that's so like I say I don't I wasn't around for the move to Willow Street I mean the the district pulled the plug on the, this grand project that they had. You know, the, uh, what did they call it? The Washington Humanities and Arts Center. You know, it lasted really not very long. And then they could, the rents went up. My, my impression is the reason that they closed the building to artists was the rents were getting, they could get a lot more money from other people. And they just, that ended. So the center had to go somewhere. And like I said, is, is, who, who is the woman who was the director when it closed? Francie Hester. Is Francie Hester here? Francie Hester was the, was the uh, last was, executive director. I was hoping she would come because I can't really ta address that because I had, I had left. Um, I guess my uh, last thing I'll say is that what um, Ms. Frank said is that it's really, the work isn't done and the glass ceiling of power and money has not been broken by women artists. And there was a big article in the Washington Post, it was the front page of the uh, style section not that long ago about how women are not getting, they're not in the, represented in the major collections to the degree that men are anywhere close and they're not represented in the high auction sales and um, who wrote that? Smee, I think, or Snee. You should definitely read that if you haven't. And um, then I was reading some papers that Maura Riley wrote, some articles, and uh, I think that she has a really good point. And the statistics are still pretty horrible, but they're very reflective of the rest of the culture. And you know, it's a it's a long fight, and um, we're not anywhere near done. Thank you. And Francoise. Okay. We'll see if I can get it. That's it. Get up close. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if I can. Good afternoon. Now that you have heard all about the history, that comes the fun part, putting the show together. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Jack and Judy for talking me into being the curator. I wasn't sure when they first asked me whether I wanted to do it. I had retired from the art world and I had moved to Mexico. So um, at first I hesitated, but I finally accepted and I'm glad I did. I really enjoyed doing this show and reconnected with a lot of you that I hadn't seen or heard from for many, many years. Um, I do have a background in, in fine arts too. I studied first at American University, and then moved on to Albany, New York, and got my graduate, graduate degree uh, from the State University of New York in Albany, and then started working in the art gallery there at the uh, university. Came back to Washington in 1975, just in time, and uh, I got a job at the Franz Bader Art Gallery in those days. Many of you knew that, that gallery, and he was really the first uh, gallery that showed contemporary art in Washington, I think in the 50s or so. So um, that's how I sort of connected to the Washington art scene. Through the gallery, I met many artists who came by. 
student of art. Uh, at the time, he was on Pennsylvania Avenue and so on. Um, when we, I also want to say thank you to Chrissy Ann, who is, uh, I guess she's the assistant director? Or associate the, director. Associate director, and she did a wonderful job. This was not an easy exhibition, and 92 artists were involved, and uh, it took a lot of work from many people. Uh, besides Chrissy Ann, there was Victoria Proctor. Many of you talked to Victoria when you had to enter your work into the program to send in your images and information. And Victoria was very helpful and very patient. So, and I also want and to congratulate... The what? Relentless, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I also want to thank, thank Elizabeth Coghill for this beautiful catalog. She really did a great job. Um, when I first talked to Jack about the show, we, we had no idea, and to Judy, we had no idea how many artists we were going to be able to reach out. We thought maybe 40, 50, we had no idea. So we talked about the idea of having two shows, one that would feature the work that was done between 75 and 87, and another one that would show more recent work by the same artists who had continued to be active and uh, producing art. But then we got more than 110 entries. So I changed gear and decided now what I really want to do is put together a show that will feature what was happening in, in those years between 75 and 87 so that it, the show will give people an idea of who those artists were, what kind of work they were producing, the variety of work. It would be more of a historical show. And then on the side, we can have a slideshow that will feature images or more recent work by some of those artists. And I hope many of you have had an opportunity to, do, to look at the slideshow, which is really excellent. Um, it was difficult for many artists to enter their information into this program. It was all done on the computer. Uh, finally, I think everybody got their work in. It was a little hard for me to access some of the information. I had some time to look at um, an image and then I had to find the, the title and the year of this image someplace else. So um, it took a lot of time, and, but I think I, I looked at everything at least four times. <laughs> So in putting the show together, first I was, I wanted to be sure there was, the work was quality work and that I felt was quality work. I also wanted to have a variety of pieces. I was thinking about the show altogether. Jack told me we could have about eight, 90 pieces, we would have the whole downstairs and I was very happy about that. So I started thinking also about how the show was going to look all together to keep in mind I needed some small works and some large work, some three-dimensional pieces, and I'm sorry we didn't get more sculpture, but I guess 40 years later, it's not so easy <laughs> to, uh, to have sculpture available. So I tried to put together something that I felt was really an exciting show visually and that would do justice to the work that was being done in those years. Um, I think uh, people seem to like the show, so I'm happy some of the comments I've had that uh, there was, it could be a show, it could be work that has been done, that is being done right now, that uh, is being produced right now. It's very exciting work. So I am uh, happy I was involved and thank you for inviting me. Thank and you, thank Francis. you for all the good work. Thank you. So before we turn it over to the audience, maybe if, is there anything that uh, you would like to address to each other? Any, any uh, uh, startling facts you've learned? Or? Well, I did want to just say something, and you can actually see it, although not read it, out in the display case that Claudia was kind enough to assemble for us. But we did have, I think it was two, uh, two volumes of poetry called Center Words. So we did have a literary committee. We had an Edith Blum lecture series that featured a lot of well-known writers. And also the Pro Femina Theater um, was started under our umbrella. 
correct me if I'm wrong, do I have that right? It started under us. We had a DC slide registry. It was a very, very active organization. It was visual artists and certainly more. And uh, to add to what Tina was saying, part of the time being, because I, I spent some time involved on Q Street and then later on at uh, Landsbergs. I was a managing director. Tina hired me. She was the executive director. And the difference was that I got paid $6 an hour and my <laughs> boss got paid nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it covered my parking tickets on 7th Street, um, but just, just about. But um, it was really exciting to be down there because there was a Washington Area Lawyers for the Arts, the um, Gala Hispanic Theater, a lot of other organizations that were in there. And we were all also involved in the running of the building. And so it was a, it was a very different mood than when we were on Q Street, which was just us. And, um, you know, we were sort of lured there by the district government and then kicked out by the district government. So, well, we're all familiar with that. But anyway, it, it was just a, a really wonderful, wonderful experience. So. so I wanted to add some things about the beginning of the Art Center. Get up to the microphone. Um, there were six of us on the founding committee, and one of the ways that we developed the structure was so that that the members had to take part in everything. So it was a member on a, a, a board, um, the committees, you know, people had to have some responsibility. And that, some, that structure kept, um, stayed in place for the whole history of it. And it made it so that people felt ownership of whatever part they were doing. And um, it, it and, and we had quite a, a larger literary, we had a literary journal in the beginning. One of the members of the committee was Anne Slayton Leffler, who was a writer, and we had a, a serious literary journal that didn't last too long. It took too much, um, it took more work than, than could be done. So that's, and we planned the whole center and all, its structure and all the committees and everything in a six month period and found the space and opened up, and um, our first speaker before we had a space with Catherine Ann Porter, and she spoke for us, at Na it was her last public appearance, and she spoke for us at um, Mount Vernon College in their chapel. So that was our, we decided to have programs before we opened our doors. So those are some details. That's neat. And I, and I was so grateful that a f to walk into a structure that was an, was an all-volunteer organization, and there was one gallery manager employee, and the whole rest of these millions of people working <laughs> were all doing it as a volunteer. And I came from a, a, a co-op dormitory at sort of a bit of an avant-garde 70s thing in the, at the University of Connecticut. So this just fit in with my philosophy completely. Let me read you the names of the committees and the people who are here from those days will probably recognize a bunch of them. We had an, al we had an alternative spaces committee. Oh, that would be <laughs> awesomely good. The alternative spaces committee, the, yes, no, the building committee, the bulletin board group, <laughs> the Edith C. Blum lecture series. Nobody's standing, so or very few people want to stand. Okay. Um, the exhibitions committee, which was a rolling thing, and I think there were a, um, almost everybody was on it at some point um, because they produced catalogs and the invitations and catalogs. These were catalogs that were coming out once a month or every two months, and the, the effort into the, of this was phenomenal. The feminist artist group, which we still had, even though I always sort of, as you say, I always pictured that everybody involved was a feminist, but we had a specific <laughs> feminist artist group. We had a fiber network group, a film series, a fundraising committee, a gallery staffing group, which as the description says, it, it's what keeps the WWAC <laughs> alive. <laughs> <Someone Yay>. <laughs> um, and they were building, they were working on the fundraising network and, um, you know, so obviously that was a big deal to get the fundraising going and, and develop grant proposals. We had an internship program, a library committee, a literary committee, a membership committee, the newsletter committee, which was really a, a, a tremendously hardworking group because they produced this 
sometimes 10-page document once a month and um, got it mailed with stamps, remember? <laughs> um, a photographer's group, a printmaker's group, who was one of the more active groups, they were always having shows even outside the center. They mounted shows around the city and exchanged shows. The pro Feminist Theater, the Public Relations Committee, I'm not done, the Sculpture Group, the Special Events Committee, the Sunday Salon, the Workshops Committee, and they were very active, um, and the Zip Code Committee. <laughs> <laughs> which I actually have no memory of, but um, <laughs> evidently we had one. Um, so, you know, remember all that. You all, and a lot of people in this room were involved in one of those or more. And I guess the other thing I wanted to say was one of the things I got from... Um, it's going to be shown. Yeah, okay. Oh, it is? I think Jack is Are you blending. showing this? Yeah, it's it's up on um, the. I don't. Oh, currently, I no, think it's they've not. Been well, anyway, I don't think it's been. A have they? They were going to alternate between the two. I don't. Okay, know it's kind of hard to see. Uh, yeah. I kind of hard to read, but. All right. Uh, well, there's a few few factoids that I'll throw out at you. It, that's it up now. Yeah, that's they a, they do. It's now. Oh, that's it's from here. But the ones that really jump out at me is 51 percent of visual artists today, working, are women. <coughs> so 51 percent. 65 to 70 percent of students now in MFA programs are women. Five percent of artworks in major museum walls are by women in the U.S. And three to five percent of artworks in permanent collections in U.S. museums are by women. Dead silence. <laughs> <laughs> Nine percent of artists in the ninth edition of Janssen, so I assume that the ninth edition is the current one. Okay, 9% of them are women, but this is up from none in 1986. And when I went to college, I went to art school in the, in the 70s, I graduated in 79, none of my art professors were women, zero. Now that has improved, but the ceiling is totally still there. No, oh, thank you. Um, I I did want to mention that I curated a show at the Washington Women Arts Center in Landsberg in 1985. It was a sculpture show. And talking about the local art scene, I don't know if many of you remember that Jack used to have a gallery. Oh, yes. <laughs> Between 78 and 82. That was my father. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually have a letter where he turned me down. <laughs> So, uh, and it was uh, near the building museum, all the way down on 3rd Street, and I'm not sure. So, Jack, how many women artists did you have in your gallery? <laughs> I think there's probably about 10 here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? Yeah, you showed them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other uh, comments before we turn this over? Thank you for that, Francoise. <laughs> so, uh, Couldn't help it. So if you have a question or a comment, please just raise your hand and we'll get a, uh, a microphone over to you. Okay. But, no, 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 because they, they can't hear you back there. No. It's, it's honestly. No, no there's a microphone. I, can't, I, can't. I would like every woman who was part of the activities throughout the years who is here to please stand up. Good idea. If you can. <laughs> if you can. There you go. <laughs> Since I borrowed the microphone from Betsy, I would just like to let everybody know that the faculty in art history at AU has historically been all women. Yay. Founded by Mary Garrett and Norma Browdy. And also, some of you may be interested that on September 28th and 29th and 30th, I think, uh, will be the sixth Feminist Art History Conference here at AU. It is an international conference. Um, there is a fee, but you can find information about it um, online. So, thank you. Great. Thank you, Helen. Great for AU. I want to say that um, Rosemary Wright, who's in the front row, and I and Cynthia Bickley Green did a panel at the last one. And it's a really interesting conference. It's worth going to. A lot of information, a lot of really exciting things about what's happening around the world. Mm -hmm. 
I'm glad there's another one. Do we have, like, raise your hand. Tina. I'm really interested that you felt that. Speak right into it. Uh, my, my comment is um, about Tina's saying that she felt when she came to D.C. that the DuPont Circle area, the Q Street location, <laughs> was kind of stayed, uh, you know, uh, may stodgy. stodgy neighborhood. And uh, uh, I have to say that when I first uh, went to the Washington Women's Art Center, which was like in 75, I was terrified. <laughs> it was uh, not uh, such a safe neighborhood. And uh, I had to park several blocks away and uh, it was in the evening and I uh, walk ran at, to the building and it wasn't open when I got there and I had to like bang on the door. Uh, so I was very happy to get inside. And um, eventually I lived in that neighborhood. Uh, it was a year or two after my first visit. And my, uh, my mother came with me when I was moving in and the landlady was there on the front porch. And while I was inside, my mother said to the landlady, she said, is, is this neighborhood okay? Is this a safe neighborhood for a young woman to live in? And the landlady looked at her and she said, well, I live here. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at, at the time, uh, DuPont Circle was, you know, was kind of an iffy, was a great bohemian artist neighborhood and there were uh, bookstores that had poetry readings all the time, and there was uh, a pub there with uh, Irish music, um, <laughs> you know, Irish music and the drop-ins, and I mean, it was it was a pretty cool yeah. neighborhood. So I guess by the time you came, uh, the buildings were so run down that they were starting to be renovated. Yeah, I mean, so I think that things changed in five years. I mean, the DC, yeah. DC changes a lot in five years as develop yes. as things get gentrified and developed. And I do, even in 80, the DuPont Circle was, it had its edgy parts, but compared to downtown, it was, it was uptown. <laughs> uh, the way we found the space, um, it was, I, I went around with Alice Denny looking at spaces for the WPA, and we went to the torpedo factory was being looked at then to be developed, and we went there and walked over construction um, we went to the she wanted it she wanted us to go in on the was what was it G Street where they finally got the big space um, she wanted the Women's Art Center to go in with that but we decided we wanted to be separate um, and um, the, we finally got that space because Josephine Withers who was one of the founders it was her relative space it had been a, a doctor's office that um, the doctor had died many years before and they just simply closed the doors. So they, they offered it to us and we took it. And it was an edgy area then, and Adams Morgan was too. It was not expensive, it was um, crime ridden. Yeah. Those, those were the good old days. Yeah. Um, I did, Lucy Blankstein was, I don't know if Lucy, if you were the first executive director or an early executive director, but Lucy had some experience in terms of outreach by the D.C. government. I think you said you worked, uh, there was a program at the D.C. jail or something, if you want to talk about oh, those kinds of things. Yes, well, um, I started uh, when Ronnie Tuck was the executive director. And um, we had it. You have to put, put it right, right, in on, right, right in your, on your mouth. mouth. No. Right in your mouth. Like that. Yeah. Right up right to there. your lips. Okay. Right up there. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm not coordinating. Um, I started when Ronnie Tuft was the executive director, um, and uh, one of the exhibitions that we had at that time was uh, from this called From the Center, and uh, the uh, the center had a um, grant from the uh, 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 Department of Human Arts and Humanities, uh, and uh, part of the exhibition was to go around and uh, to various venues in the city, and one of those venues was the Women's Detention Center. Uh, a group of us went around hanging the shows in these different venues, and one of the participants in our group was Christina Edmondson. Um, that who was a photographer, wonderful photographer. And uh, the day that we went to the detention center, 
Uh, we were all a little nervous about going into a jail. Uh, the clang of the doors behind us, keys rattling. I think we were wanted, you know, to see that we didn't bring any contraband. Uh, was a little unnerving, but uh, the purpose of it was to uh, hang some of our work uh, in the recreation center that they had. It was very sad because we knew that these people were trapped in this particular place, and um, we weren't uh, comfortable trying to communicate with them as to why we were putting work of art on the walls and <coughs> what we expected of them and asked the questions. So it was a little um, difficult at first, but uh, Christina, who was very sensitive, uh, had taken pictures of very simple things, like rocks on the ground, and she started to explain why it was that she found these things moving to her or interesting to her. And after a while, she asked uh, some of the uh, people there to close their eyes and imagine a place, some very comfortable place or something that had memories for them. In that way, she brought out uh, sympathetic and uh, we were able to communicate with the women there and they began to tell stories and to do some illustrations of their own work. So it was a very exciting experience for us. Mm -hmm. That was just uh, one of the things that would happen at the center. The center was so vital and every day uh, full of people doing different things and it was such a privilege for me to be part of it. Um, I made so many friends that I still have today, and uh, I'm really grateful uh, for this show because I think it brought out the spirit of everybody who participated. Any other hands out there? Okay. Yes. Um, um, you mentioned uh, Jack's gallery. That brought up a memory of one of my more important memories of uh, the Washington Women's Art Center was my taking a workshop with Joan Mister that was called The Business of Art. Yes. That was really helpful and opened my eyes to the, you know, that side of the, the art world. And we went to a couple of artist studios and they talked to us about you know, what, what they did about their business. A uh, curator talked to us, and we also went to Jack's gallery, who, um, who told us, you know, what he does and, you know, how he uh, approaches the business. And it was all very meaningful to me at the time. Well, there were many women-owned arts gallery in town. Um, Barbara Kornblatt, I remember. Uh, Jane Haslam. Diana Brown, Barbara, Barbara Fendrick, 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 Barbara yeah, Fendrick, Jane, Fendrick, Fendrick, Jane Fendrick, Haslam, Jones Troyer, Lastman, Fitzpatrick, yeah. Wallace and Wentworth, yeah, right. Like a lot lot of, of, uh, Addison Ripley, it was um, Sylvia Ripley was yeah, part of Sylvia. that. So. Yeah, I just wanted to say that particular Marjorie Goldberg, right? Cor course, you were talking about um, star something similar started in 1976 called Understanding the Art World. And Joan Mister was actually a participant then. She wasn't running it. I think it was maybe Mary Beth Edelson, Charlotte Robinson. Uh, I can't remember who. There were about three. And, oh, uh, Joyce Tennyson. Joyce Tennyson Cohn, right. And so we were the first ones who did that course. And, um, and it was like, for me, I had gotten my, my MFA in 1970, and I had not a clue on how to do slides or do a presentation or anything. And um, so we had this course, and afterwards, several of us stayed together and decided to put to use some of what we'd learned, and we did the 13 Answer Show the following spring. Um, but then after, for several years after, they continued to have this program and and the se several of the artists who participated would then do their own show so we were 13 answers and then we were followed I think by 14 hang-ups 15 something else I can't remember but I think it ran for about five years and um, it was actually a really memorable experience for us so. yeah the learn that's what I was saying the learning with Kurt the things you could learn from just being involved were phenomenal I never took the class but I feel like the, the skills that I learned 
working with the center as a volunteer, we're, I've used the rest of my life and it's been priceless. You learn to do an invitation, to take a picture of your artwork and be able to package it and enter something. I mean, that's all things I learned from the Washington Women's Art Center. survival classes led by Terry Bronstein. She's in California and she's not feeling well, so she couldn't come. Terry, I talked to her. Um, I'm Sarna Marcus. Um, it is amazing to be here. The, the importance of WWAC in my life could never, ever really be adequately explained. I was a new artist, or you know, I'd gone to art school, but I really didn't understand what it would mean to be a practicing artist. Um, my work was in one of the exhibits, and I had started to work pretty big. And uh, one day, Joan Mister called me. She was my buddy, and I miss her terribly here, because she belongs here. Uh, and she said, Benjamin Forge says your work is oddly anthropomorphic. <laughs> who, who said that? Does anyone remember Benjamin Forge? Yeah. He's the art critic at the Post. And I just got, I was so excited. You know, I'd never been written up before. There was that. And also, uh, I had never been present when people were looking at my work. And I was looking at the people looking at my work for the first time, and uh, it was incredible. And I had started working more edgy, a little, a little braver. Um, there was that. There were so many things. I was on the board, and Eloise Shuttler, are you here? No. 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 Was the most brilliant chair I have, <laughs> have known in my life since. She taught me how to, a board should be run. And we got so much accomplished every single time we met. I know everyone says that, but this was really the truth. The other thing is center words. You mentioned center words. I designed the cover. I laid out the interior. And my wife, Tina Lunson, printed it. And she's here, too. So it just brings back many things. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. Oh, she was a typesetter. There was somebody Right Behind there. me. So, is this? Yep, it's on. It's on. It's on. You turned it off. <laughs> okay. Um, my name is Georgiana, and um, I moved here in 1992 with um, somewhat of an arts background, but mainly literature. And I wish I'd known about the women's group when I came, but I wanted to tell you, because it just hit me when I was sitting here today, that you all may not be aware of the fact that also born in Washington, D.C. in around 1994 was an association called the Society for the Study of Early Modern Women. And this started out with a group of women who met at the Folger Library to talk about literature but then they moved on from there and they met <laughs> once a month at the Museum for Women in the Arts who gave us space. Elizabeth Wells was the one in charge of it. And it was art historians, it was people in literature, it was historians, people in a variety of disciplines. And out of that, we had a conference to which we invited local teachers. And there was a, um, the night before the conference, a whole bunch of us had dinner down at 701 Restaurant and we decided that we wanted to, to start this association for studying early modern women in whatever field. Um, and we did, and now it's an international group and it has a prize-winning journal. So it's something else, Women Center, that started in Washington, D.C. And we should be proud of that, that history. Any other hands out there? They have to be as qualified as they can. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm Rebecca Stevens, 
and I was a juror once many years ago, which Barbara Willannon reminded me of, because truthfully I'd forgotten. But I was curious to know, how did the center interact with other arts groups at the time, with WPA, with everything that was happening? Well, did you keep to yourself? Did you wall yourself off um, because you felt that's I, all the I can time only you talk had? from my own experience. Sure. I, I think others probably more so, and probably people uh, in the audience can as well. Um, certainly, I think when we were at Landsbergs, we did because that was it was all around us. As Tina was saying, there were the drummers and you know the, the Gala Hispanic Theater, and it, it just, you couldn't help but interact. And we were also responsible for helping run the building, you know, some of the decisions to be made. So I would say we definitely interacted. Um, if you're asking, did we do projects with them, if that's what you mean, I, I personally don't recall much of that. As, uh, the DC slide registry, which I think was I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, started as uh, under our umbrella and later broke off and was a separate organization. No, no. But, was, okay, I've got WPA. that wrong. Then. It, actually, okay. it was a separate organization that Rosemary okay. and Terry ran. Got it. Back. So there's a expert right there. But I, I can't think of situations where we actually did programming with somebody else. But there, we certainly interacted because we were in the same building and, that, and we just had decisions and discussions that we had to make. Well, we did do exchange shows with other galleries in other okay. cities. We had exchange shows with a powerhouse gallery in Toronto. We had exchange shows with a, with a group in, I don't know what the gallery name was. It was called Women Exhibiting in Boston. Yeah, and it's I don't all know. in the catalog. We got all the shows and the exchanges are in there, in the back of the catalog. Right, right. Some the specific shows where we did collaborations, right, right. but mm -hmm. but you're talking also about organizational collaboration, and and um, yeah, I can't think of a lot to tell you the mm -hmm. truth. I, when I was executive director, when we were moving downtown, the WPA was established in their own building, and to, my impression and I could be wrong, anybody can correct me, but my impression was that the WPA, we, they were sort of the, the, the big cat on the block and we were a little ghettoized. You know, we were, um, yeah, they didn't really want to work with us. <laughs> <laughs> we, were, we were a co-op, so there was something, but there was an edge to being in a co-op that was a bit negative. So the other group was the Women's Caucus for Art that was mm -hmm. founded at the same time, that met Claudia. I went to a meeting, I remember seeing Claudia there in the 70s, and the whole um, Lifetime Achievement Awards in 1979, we have that in the catalog, but there was a lot of overlap there, but that was another group, mm -hmm. and that, that organization is still going. Yeah, so. yeah. In the beginning, also, uh, uh, on um, Q Street was also IPS. Um, um, was also I, I, IPS. Which What's was IPS? A research Policy group. Ah. Um, Institute for Policy, Policy yeah. Studies. Mm -hmm. And they had a little gallery and there were shows in there and people in there were doing research into social development. I mean, all, all kinds of subjects. So uh, there were a lot of, uh, th you know, those kinds of um, social socially minded organizations right around a DuPont circle and you know they all came by there was a barbershop next door there were people coming in the art center from the bookstore from uh, you know a DuPont circle was a big place where people would sit and play guitars and uh, you know enjoy uh, communing with the universe uh, you could say and uh, so it, it was a very active place and many women's groups also came and met at the art center um, there were uh, the House of Ruth, we did some projects with. Uh, I remember um, people from the bookstore would come, the poetry group sort of back and forth with the bookstores. Um, also, um, uh, the Rape Crisis Center, other feminist organizations met at the center or came and talked to us about uh, doing shows there or working with their um, members or the people that they served. So. Yeah, there was quite a bit of give and take with all kinds of organizations. And some, some groups actually rented our space to have events. 
it was very small space, but they would have a conference meeting at, at the space or something like that. So it was really wild. It was always good to be able to make a little bit of money okay. that way. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just wanted to mention that um, there is a website called voicesandmore.com which has the uh, videos of the, some of the people who are in the show, and uh, I hope you get a chance to uh, check that out. Yeah, it's actually the video the is running in the gallery now, and there's also a PowerPoint, which I don't know, I, earlier was playing, but has uh, all of the artists who entered the work, their artist statement, and uh, uh, usually in most cases, their newer work. So the sort of a way of, of the more contemporary work being seen. Uh, I'm Rosemary Wright. I was uh, on the board when Charlotte Robinson was executive director and in the inaugural exhibition. But I wanted to talk more about the events that spun off immediately after the Corcoran Conference in 72, one of which was the registry. Um, at that time, Lucy Lepard was establishing what she called the West East Bag, and uh, what she was doing was nominating two people in every major city that she could to uh, essentially begin this networking that intended to establish women's skills, basic skills in, in the profession, which we were all declaring we didn't have. Um, and so uh, she nominated me to organize the visual arts and Josephine Women withers to organize uh, academics, artists, art history, and, and curators. The, and there was a list of things that we were supposed to do in every city uh, all around the country right away. And the first thing was the registry. The second thing was to run consciousness raising, and that ran in my house for a year. And um, out of that, uh, out of those two things, lots of things started to spring up before the Washington Women's Art Center was ever founded. We did the paperwork show, Dale Appleman is here, she did the uh, brochure for the paperwork show. And so th the energy was so huge and the projects were coming so fast, the ideas were coming so fast that we needed an umbrella organization to use um, for applying for grants. So seven of us founded a 501c3, the Ad Hibbit Committee, which was the umbrella organization for many projects um, three traveling museum exhibitions done by Charlotte Robinson. Um, we did the first uh, history of Alice Neal, and film history of Alice Neal's work. And, um, and the Adhibit Committee was the initial 501c3 that the, that the Washington Women's Arts Center used until they established their own not-for-profit status. So that's just testimony of the energy that came out of that conference. We didn't have a building or, or a roof or a penny even, but the stuff was just flying out of everybody's imagination so fast that we had to respond to it and, and get organized around it. It was great fun. All right. Any other uh, questions or comments? Anybody wonder, I mean, what's, what's needed now? I mean, is everything good? <laughs> like, uh... Big question. <laughs> at one point, we were, uh, when we were at the Feminist Art History Conference, we were throwing around an idea of having another uh, national conference for women in the visual arts, and we were very excited about it, and then um, life took over, and our politics changed. But um, So that was one idea that came up. I know Claudia had an idea about something you talked to me about at the opening, a foundation of some sort. Um, but I said, who has the energy for it? <laughs> <laughs> Claudia's got the energy. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I don't want to hug, but I, I, um, I have so much more that it, of course it came to me as soon as I sat down. Um, the reason I think we did not uh, work with many of the other groups for social change in, in DC was that we were girls and we were seen as girls. I think at the time that women were becoming more feminist minded, women artists, for example, who had not thought of themselves ever as being feminists were suddenly seeing, well, maybe there's something I should think about. The main thing that I wanted to bring up was that there were two threads going on when I was a member, which was, I guess, 78 to 81, I think. 
Um, and that is, we needed to get more exposure for women artists because, as you see, we still are challenged in that area. But also, was there such a thing as women's art? And this was huge at the time. Judy Chicago's opening, a group of us went from the center to San Francisco for the opening of the dinner party. And, you know, I sort of got vaginaed out at the end. I thought, <laughs> if I ever see another thing that's a vagina, I'm never going to, you know, paint it again. Because a lot of the stuff that I was experimenting with had, you know, somewhat recognizable parts, but not as overt. In any case, we did communicate. There was a lot of networking among women's groups, among women artists groups, in other cities, mostly the two coasts, New York and California. And so those were, and there was so much vibrant activity. Lu uh, Lucy Lepard, I can hardly remember all the names that are coming back to me. I also have a huge uh, cache of, of archives, which I need to donate. But um, remember, this was an interesting time. There were women who were very sensitive about being included in anything that said feminist. And there were other people who were starting to align themselves with that thinking. It was a very, very important time. And I think we really did create that footprint. I, I think, certainly in my life, it was a big deal. I just want to go. All right, well, thank you. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Right. right.